My talk today is on social, technical, and organizational factors for insider threat detection. Now, um, it is an uncomfortable subject for some, mainly because a lot of pen testers don't like dealing with the squishy bits, but this is realistically about learning to be able to predict when a threat actor within or a, an insider will turn rogue. All right. Some things to remember, this is not an exact science when you're dealing with people and probability, things never are. So you may disagree with some of this. This is not my work. I am standing on the shoulders of giants. This is actually uh, foundationally done by Perseric and a guy named Frank Greitzer out in the States. So what is insider threat? Well, we probably all know that, but just to reiterate it, it's a current or former employee or a contractor uh, and it's interesting to note that 68% of all insider threat comes from contractor or negligent employee actions. Other business partner who has or has had authorized access to an organization's network system or data who intentionally, and the important bit here is unintentionally, exceeds or misuses that access to negatively affect the company. They can do it for personal gain on all the nasty stuff or by accident. The important thing to remember here is realistically the vast majority of insider threat is actually done through process flaw of contractor or employee negligence. The nasty ones, the, the people with nasty intent, only form about a third of the actual cases. So why do we need to worry? Well, we all know that insiders have a lot of access. They're trusted individuals who are given credentials. Um, they are often believed to be on your side, but they will not be. The issue is, is that the focus on the technical indicators for insider threat may be too late. So what this framework seeks to do is to give you early warning indicators for people's behavior that may indicate a threat actor. So uh, it's easy to say that hindsight is 2020, but what this framework is attempting to do is to give you some insight into who might turn rogue. So like I said, this was actually comes out of some very old work from uh, a military background. They defined an initial set of things that you would look for in a threat actor and things that might actually impact them, such as their workplace environment, their personal life, and the things and the pressures that they have on them, as well as the processes and procedures that are run by a company that control their workflow and their actions. All right. Now, often people think that it is only the person but the processes within a company are just as important, and the framework starts to recognize that. The ontology begins with three main areas, and you'll notice they're in funky colors, and you'll see those colors start to appear in previous slides to show what they relate to, but effectively it boils down to factor, actor, and their intent, whether it be malicious or otherwise. You've got their personal factors and their personal life, the nature versus nurture aspect. You've got the organizational factors and the procedures within the company that control their behavior. Uh, and like I said, and then you've got intent, which may actually be unintentional and allow internal threat through an accident. So the ontology starts to, be, to build. All right? You can break it down into certain sections, such as boundary violations, cybersecurity violations. You can actually look at job performance and life narrative and psychological factors. As you can see, the, uh, the, the framework starts to grow, and it's going to grow very quickly because people are complex, so the framework is complex. So you're going to get a lot of data points, and the problem is, is the framework then becomes very unwieldy, and then you're going to have to turn to a computer to basically start to do the work for you. You'll also start to notice that BYOD starts to become a problem because many of the indicators can be hidden by people who are actually using BYOD because you can't actually find out whether they're doing work or they're doing personal stuff on their computer. So that's one of the first elements that you start to see that as the framework is applied, certain organizational behaviors become problematic, BYOD being one of them. You then start to get the organizational factors, such so as security practices, their communication and their management structure. Do you have a blame culture? Do you have a support culture? You've got work planning and control. Are you putting too much pressure on individuals? Are you asking too much of them? And as such, are you forcing them into a corner? Is their personality such that when you force them into the corner, they might lash out or do something that is not in your benefit? All right? You can actually start to things, you can start to take in uh, process controls that were, will start to uh, mitigate or counteract those, such as vetting or background checks and review processes and various other things, making certain that you've actually got the things that people want and make them happy within your workplace. So 
let's see what this is actually useful for. Now, this is often called the left of the bang diagram. And what it shows is that we realistically, we rely as threat intelligence mainly on technical factors to indicate when a threat is about to happen. The problem is the socio-technical, the squishy stuff, may actually give us an earlier warning to that that we miss because we don't take it into account. The question then becomes how do you get those systems into a framework so that you can actually start to, to deal with them. HR has always been the go-to for this. But Realistically, they may not have the visibility needed. You can start to see that some of the behaviors, uh, a big ego or manipulation of others within the staff, callousness to coworkers, may turn into verbal abuse uh, or lashing out at others, possibly at management, intimidating behaviors, threats, whether against the company or others, threats of retaliation, you know, this company couldn't operate without me, that's an early warning, excessive absences, which may be due to a number of reasons, they may have just stopped caring. All right? They could become overly critical. And by overly critical, I mean the kind of people who can never be made happy. No matter what you give them, no matter how much you meet them in the middle, they've still got something to bitch about. All right? it, they then turn into the beginnings of the technical indicators that most of us would start to react to, such as an access or policy violation on working unusual hours or access to prohibited materials, then turns into IP theft. What Soffit is attempting to do is give you a heads up in the months beforehand based on non-technical elements that say, eh, this person might not be headed in the right direction. All right, you can start to calculate these risks and you can actually start to apply numbers to them. Now this is where people start to get a little uncomfortable. All right, these are not my numbers. These are psychologist numbers, and they start to apply these things on a scale as to what actually might be considered a, uh, a, a behavior that you might see as something problematic within your company. All right? The reason that we're giving these numbers is we're going to turn this into a, a, uh, basically a decision engine, which comes later, and you can then start to apply these factors, put them into a computer, and start to calculate numbers. So. This creates a risk score, okay? You can actually start to apply weighting to individual behaviors that are more problematic than others. And multiple occurrences of those start to become additive. So you can start to take these and feed these into your computer and say, well, you know, working off-site unusual hours once, that's a blip. Doing it 18 times a month, but without being paid, you might want to ask, are they really that friendly or are they up to something else? This is not an indicator that they have gone rogue. It is an indicator of behavior that may be problematic. All right? So it's, in essence, a means of giving you a heads up of certain things that might add up. You might notice one or two, but you may have missed all the others. And they may add up into somebody who is actually becoming a threat actor within your company. So, but what's normal, okay? Dealing with people, you're never gonna get a normal, all right? Skewed industries such as InfoSec actually attract certain behaviors that other companies might actually see as problematic. You can even go online and find some examples. There's a particular Twitter account by the name of Jonathan, who if you follow and you start to apply this framework, starts to give you an abundance of red flags, all right? The issue is that person may not be a bad actor. They may just be problematic, and you may be able to apply other controls or other restrictions upon them to make them less of a threat. So Soffit takes into account the lack of focus that may be an accidental threat too, all right? You've got a tired parent with a newborn. That's a life factor. That's a pressure that they can't get to go away. Working from home, which is an organizational factor, may not be as vigilant if they're deprived of sleep. That's a distal pressure on them, making them possibly more irritable, less conscientious, okay? An additional oversight might be applied, process or monitoring or assistance, maybe even part-time working, that reduces the distal factors and it may be needed to prevent accidental behaviors or threats with a lack of conscientiousness, all right? It's not trying to tell you that the tired parent is a bad person. It's trying to tell you that the tired parent has problems that may make them an internal threat by accident because 
things have added up for them that have made their life a little bit more difficult. So, so how do we basically start to apply these? Well, we've got certain behaviors that you can actually take on. Things like cyber loafing or negative evaluations are often early HR indicators. You spend three hours on Facebook a day. That might not be what your company wants of you, and it may not be in their best interest. Other concerning work habits, maybe attendance issues, blurred professional boundaries, people taking liberties. They may actually start to be minor policy violations. You may get social engineering or Machiavellianism within the company where people start to manipulate others. You can also then start to get technical violations. Now, most of the people in this room will probably be very aware of those and very on board for picking any of those that come up with the systems that they already have. So, we start to then take in things like life narrative. Many of these will be weeded out by our vetting process or our hiring process, such as criminal records or financial concerns as part of, of the vetting process. You may actually get personal here, uh, history, such as demographics or an ideology or something that comes into effect. You also may be dealing with neurodiversity. This is important because Soffit takes into account that neurodiverse people may appear slightly differently in the scale to others. That, again, does not make them bad or threat actors. It just makes them slightly different on the scale. As such, it is important to create a norm for each person because what you're looking for is changes in behavior. It is the change in behavior that is your trigger here. All right? Unless you've let them in and they've always intended to be a threat actor from day one, yeah, in which case your vetting processes probably aren't as good as you would like, but you're looking for a change in behavior that shows that they have pressures, whether at home or work or otherwise, that are pushing them into a problematic state. All right? You may also get other ideologies. You can get lone wolves. Lone wolves is a big problem within pen testing. Radical beliefs, you know, people may believe in conspiracy theories or other things that push them into digging into areas that they shouldn't. All right? So we talk about the dynamic state. All right? We talk about the things that people have that might be a problem. Excessive anger, hostility, disengagement, or mood swings are an early indicator. Again, that may just be part of that person's makeup. What you're looking for is excessive or changes in that behavior. If somebody goes on a rant once a week, yeah, and you've let it blow over you, it's pretty harmless, maybe they start doing it four times a week, or maybe they start doing it publicly, and that may actually be a change in behavior. You may see changes in attitude, all right? But you must take into things like the personality dimensions. Now, this one's a difficult one because HR and various other systems don't necessarily take these into account. However, people provide a great deal of information online, and analytics has allowed many companies to pick up on that and assess your personality dimensions whether you like it or not. And we'll touch on that in a minute. All right? There are other personality traits that may actually be really problematic, such as Machiavellism, narcissism, psychopathy, sadism, authoritarianism, social dominance, orientation. These are the kind of scary terms that you really don't want in your company unless that person is controlled or monitored or kept at bay from others because effectively they may start to feed on your other staff. All right? Temperament. Now, again, you may start to see a norm. Certain people are just hard to work with or difficult. If they start to become unengaging or refuse to follow orders, that may be an early sign. You may see a lack of remorse for their behaviors. They've done something, and realistically, it has caused a huge problem. Wasn't me, not my problem. You know, that was them. It was their fault for doing that, all right? These are the kind of things that you should start to see as early warnings. They may not be enough to trigger action to get rid of that person, but they may actually give you an oversight or a, a red flag to say, mm, you're headed in the wrong direction. Maybe we need to put you in a different group. Maybe we need to put you with people who are, uh, pull you out of that shell or try and turn you around. So the map of human factors, uh, you've got several things that you need to remember. I've touched on some of them. Each scale will have a norm and a variance. It is often the variance that is more important than the norm. You're looking for changes in behavior. All right? Some of the nastier sounding things may not be something that you want to assess or you don't know how to assess. You may not know how to assess a Machiavellian personality within your company. You might read on it, but it's not within your wheelhouse. As such, people, are starting, people with that knowledge are starting to develop tools 
that will help you out. And Teams is coming on that real fast. All right? So we started to create this model. All right? We have the personal factors. We have the external stimuli, which operate on them, and the distal factors of how they might turn into either somebody who just leaves. Soffit's very good at alerting you for possible flight risk. Yeah? Very, very good at saying, I've seen enough behavior. This person's likely to be gone within three months. If your organization doesn't wish to lose skills, Soffit can give you the ability to interact earlier and see whether you can turn that around. All right? That's where its biggest use comes from. You've got somebody who starts to show the behaviors that show that they're on an exit path. Their behaviors may not be malicious, or they might be, depending on what kind of personality they have. Soffit gives you the early warning indicators to say, hey, actually, we may need to step in, corral that person, give them a hug, pay them more. Who knows? All right? It may be that you see that they don't get any better, in which case it has given you enough time, basically, to prepare yourself and prevent them from doing any real harm. So, depending on your business, you may never get a perfect norm, but here are some common things that most people will start to see, and HR often will pull some of these out, but they expand, and they expand, and they expand. And I'm going to show you a, a mind map of this. It gets real big, real fast. But at top level, you can actually start to see some of the things that should highlight, you know, look, if you're gambling or shopping, uh, online shopping at work, if it's during a lunch hour, maybe that's permitted. But if you're doing it during work hours, again, probably a problem. All right? Job searches may actually be indicative of a, a flight risk or somebody who is basically looking around. They may be unhappy. Again, it may be your key indicator to step in and say, actually, maybe we can give you something to make you happier, a little bit, a little bit more money or more responsibility or less responsibility. All right? Poor internal processes also allow internal threat. I see these quite regularly at companies. As part of the other job that I do, which is social engineering, I look at culture and process, and I tend to work between those to get into companies. Blame cultures, really easy. Because you play into that culture, and you basically just enact the behaviors that the company already has against the people that you meet. They expect them, and they tend to roll over for them. But that can create problems for internal threat. So you need to have communication, good communication, good policies. Make certain you're hiring the right people. The big one that comes up here is organizational justice. One of the bigger factors that is shown to be a pressure on individuals as to whether or not they're loyal to a company is whether or not they see organizational justice applied fairly within the firm. If they do not, if somebody gets away with something that somebody else does not, that tends to become an imbalancing factor. So if you have organizational justice, it must be fair. <laughs> All right. Implementation of security controls, both technical but possibly non-technical. So internal process probably usually appear in things like distractions, which are usually things like a lack of uh, proper work order. Uh, people constantly, can you just do this? Can you change to that? project changing, not giving people time to get into something properly. You can see insufficient resources. Doing more with less is great, but it tends to put pressure on people, and it tends to put pressures on them that make them back into a corner a little bit more as they try and please people with less and less, and they may then start to cheat. That may not be a direct threat, but it could cause you problems when they start to break things to, make, to get the job done. Poor management systems, as I said, things like blame cultures allow threat actors to hide easier or enact behaviors of people of upper management to get away with things that they might not otherwise. Career advancement, job instability, for, you know, poor physical work conditions, these are all things that we know about and tend to prepare for. Organizational changes are another one. People don't necessarily like change, and many people really, really don't like it and will tend to to act adversely when faced with something that they can't control. Stress and workflow, again, job pressures. Are you putting people under too much pressure? Are you putting people into a situation where they have to please or get something done, and they have to bend the rules or break things to make it happen? And by break things, I mean other people as well. They may actually put pressures on their work colleagues or others. 
to actually make certain that they look good. Uh, that may be a behavior that you don't want because effectively they're getting the gold star while they've caused five other people to become disgruntled. All right. Things like task giving as well, make certain that the people actually can do the job if they don't, or they're overskilled for their job, both of those cause problems. If they don't feel that they can do it and they don't feel that they have the right training, they're going to feel constantly questioning themselves, and if they're given a task that they feel is beneath them, they will often tend to get disgruntled in the fact that they feel that they're not being fully utilized to their full potential. All right? You may also then get things like lack of breaks. We've seen things like Amazon. You see they actually have a problem now hiring staff in certain areas because they've effectively pissed so many of them off, nobody wants to work for them anymore. So you see organizational thing behaviors for companies that cause them problems because they can no longer skill up or get staff. So mitigating factors a company can supply, all right? Flexible work schedules mean that people can take into account home or personal factors that they have to deal with, which allows them to deal with those issues without the company getting involved, all right? Healthy work environments. I have been to companies where people have literally had to work in a place that has not been vacuumed for 18 months. It's wrong, okay? And these people are basically as down as the environment that they work in, all right? Employees and assistance plans, again, to help with those life events that people are going to, to have that are going to be random. And in doing so, the, comp the individual is less likely to turn rogue because they know the company is on their side, at least to a point. Training, obviously, reporting, social support, peer support, etc., and appropriate remuneration. We all know that one's coming, and I'm not going to here to tell you whether or not people should or should not be paid more, but if people feel that they're underpaid, that's going to be a huge factor and a pressure to make them look, to make, to look for their own worth. So, as you can see here, you start to create a mind map and it gets pretty complex pretty quickly. The left hand side is organizational factors and that gets built up as you take a company and you start to put in your organizational factors until it balances the personality factors on the right hand side. All right, the thing is, as you can see, it gets huge. Why is it huge? Because they're trying to break it down into smaller and smaller pieces to be able to create a decision tree or a Bayesian network that allows them to take inputs from a variety of sources and create the ultimate risk score. All right, so let's apply a use case to all of this, okay? Here we have a, an individual case where, in essence, you've got somebody who has gone rogue. It started with criticism and resistance of others within the company, observations of hostility, yeah, you can follow the numbers here, observations of hostility uh, towards co-workers, signs of authoritarianism, uh, basically telling people, other people, that they were now in charge of certain projects, uh, which they weren't, observations of physical abuse, people actually literally being pushed around or bullied. Now, realistically, it's at this point that you should intervene. Okay, you're starting to get into changes in ego. You've seen a change in their ego, which has resulted in other staff being adversely affected by their behavior. This is your time to interject. In larger companies, they don't. They don't necessarily have the data to be able to pull up on it. Smaller companies, it's easier because obviously everybody talks to each other and you can usually see it directly. If it's not enacted then, you're gonna start seeing negative performance and valuations, or they did see them. You're gonna see passed over for promotion, which is a huge another factor, and basically a massive dent to the ego that they already had. You've got a second uh, negative evaluation, so no improvement. Then you've got statements about emails, basically saying that, um, that they, the company couldn't do without them, or that uh, you know, they could bring them down if not brought to, to, to heal. So you then start to get into to tardiness, not showing up to meetings, frequent absences, the person has given up caring. It's at this point that you should really be taking preventative action. This person has shown enough red flags and are now on a pathway that you need to protect yourself. That's what Soffit's telling you. It doesn't say that they've done anything yet, but it says that their pathway is not a good one and it's either leading to an exit or a potential intentional threat. So we then start to get into things which are, uh, you know, uh, 
of more hostility, possibly even towards managers. Yeah? We then start to get into marital separation. That's another huge factor. We've already got a person who is on slightly on tilt. Yeah, that may have bled into their home life or been a, as a part or a cause by their home life, but that is probably their tipping point right there. That's when they get to the point where they think, I've got nothing more to lose, all right? And you start to see behaviors where they're taking excessive risk and their risk perception has dropped. You see a DUI or some other petty crime, which then leads to, uh, and you start to get into cyber loafing. They're basically using your networks to, to do their own further work, which then leads to some emails going out, which some data theft. The person then goes to work with a competitor having stolen data and got it out using tools that are already existing within your company. By that point, it's too late. You've lost. Soffit is trying to give you a couple of chances to make some preventative or some, uh, to put some barriers up to prevent that from happening. All right? So, most of the case studies using Soffit have shown that insiders tend to find, follow the cyber kill chain. The problem is, well, not the problem, from their point of view, they're already inside. They don't have to maintain persistence. Yeah? They're already usually given access. And as such, they tend to follow it quite quickly. So, Internal threat actors with bad intent can actually show end-to-end -end changes in behavior to exit with your data in less than 12 weeks. So, things to look for. So, you've got, obviously, the precipitating events might be disciplinary action. You might see low honesty or manipulatism. Narcissism is a big one to watch for. Disgruntlement comes with overly critical behaviors. You then start to see some of the technical precursors. Yeah. You may also see, start to see access paths, installation of non-sanctioned software, backup software, and things like that are a key for threat, indicate, or for threat actors to basically pull your data and take it to a new uh, employer. You may also start to see unexplained affluence. Who knows? They may actually be there for the long term and actually be selling something. If you see them <laughs> driving in a brand new car and their wage doesn't, doesn't add up with that, you may want to start asking questions. Right. Then you start to get to how you can start to do this without a computer. So these are the kind of things that you can actually start to put points upon. The ones up here are obviously things that you're going to start to see. If you see a lot of those, they're a worry. Individual aspects of those may not be a problem. Add to them enduring traits. They may actually give you further red flags or show you that this behavior is not necessarily likely to go away. You then get into things where people are starting to get to the point of no return or they may actually be causing other problems which cause problems to other staff or coworkers that they work at. And then you get the last group, okay? Now, you will get these kind of individuals working in your company. Occasionally, you'll run across them. They may be quite tame, however, they actually are the kind of personality that may give a bad intent, okay? Doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to, but it does mean that you should monitor these people if they start to show excessive changes in behavior. So, you then start to be able to create an even larger list, which gets bigger and bigger. As I said, this, this framework gets huge quite quickly. It breaks it down into smaller and smaller points so that you can actually start to manage or record it. The whole point is here, some of these concepts are so broad, it's not easy to allocate them in, in, a, in a digital manner. So the framework attempts to break them down into smaller and smaller pieces. So steps your firm can take before we get to the actual how you actually build a model to actually do all of this. Consider threats. Yeah, clearly document, consistently enforce policies. Remember I said about organizational justice. Security awareness training, monitor and respond to suspicious or destructive behavior. Yeah, nip it in the bud is really the easiest thing to say. If you start to see behaviors that start to show a pathway down the soffit trail, early intervention is probably your best bet. Change their mind, all right? Track and secure the physical environment, implement strict password policies. Most of these things are the kind of stuff you should already be doing, but we tend not to see unless you are a much larger company and you have the tools to enact this. All right? However, 
we can get into some advanced topics, all right? Like I said, uh, you can actually start to get personalities that may actually be seen in our sector that may be actually potentially risky in other sectors. So pen testers are often treated slightly differently. The term herding cats usually comes into effect. So uh, certain personality traps uh, cross with certain behaviors may be normal or expected, but that may not be that you don't necessarily give them the full keys to the house, all right? The behavior, behavior may be treated as normal, but again, you're looking for the change. Intervention can be assistive or defensive. You may give them time off to go cope with a problem. Maybe they've got family issues. Look, take two weeks, take three weeks, sabbatical, unpaid leave, get your head together, come back when you feel better. Increase monitoring, change the role, position, putting them in a new environment. Maybe there's a, a personality clash that once you solve that, the problem goes away. Improve working environments, yeah, and corrective training and counseling can come into it. So let's talk about those skewed norms, all right? They come in multiple flavors, but the general problem with dark triads are narcissists, Machiavellians, psychopaths, or a combination of those two, all right? Again, you can go online, you can run the numbers, and you can start to find individuals who work in our industry who basically start to show some of these behaviors to a degree. These people are considered to be low threat. However, the psychopathy is just high enough that they might be pushed into a corner, a hard corner, and then basically react badly on your behalf, all right? Others, the really ones, are the ones that are up here. They're the Machiavellian psychopaths. They are the, the people who tend to prey on others. You'll often find that they will refuse to accept blame. They will blame others within the company. Nothing's ever their fault. Everything's always everybody else's fault. And they often show a lack of contrition or any form of uh, apology when they're actually uh, cornered or caught. So, risky behaviors by groups, all right? Realistically, it shows that the Machiavellian psychopath is the kind of person that you really don't want in your company, or if you do, you really need to put some severe uh, monitors around them. So they basically are going to be high internet users with a high risk engagement. They're going to like risky behaviors, but also have a lower than normal risk perception. Okay, They'll, they're the kind of people who go riding a motorcycle without a helmet, for instance. Okay, They're often going to be aggressive, yeah, both either passively or actively. But what studies have shown is that things like alcohol and cannabis use do not necessarily indicate threat actors, okay? They are not the actual thing that a lot of people think, oh, because you drink, you must be bad or you must have screwed up somewhere. Studies don't necessarily show that, okay? So they are often taken by HR to be early warning signs, but missing some of the other things. So where does it fit within the business, okay? The problem is it touches on everything, but the problem then becomes of getting the human information into a technical system, all right? You'll notice on things like threatened, and I'm not knocking this diagram, but you'll never see HR or those kind of functions on these threat intelligence diagrams. And realistically, they are a valid input into all of this. So building a tool, and this is already in process, Effectively, people are already out there taking all these things. You take all your logs and your security and your various other bits. You feed into the psychological factors, into a knowledge base. You may be using it either pre or post, because Sophic can also be used post-exploit to find out who might have been your person who helped out or who actually pulled the trigger. You've got rule-based reasoning, so you then start to create things that go from logs to parse those logs using machine learning to train it, and then you get output. But what do you train a machine learning tool on to get bad actors? Well, what they did is they took known bad people, people like Adolf Hitler, and known people who are internal threat actors, and they used what they had written to do word calculations to show whether or not they were neurotic, neurotic agreeable, or conscientious, the tip out of all of this is really don't hire Hitler, okay? <laughs> Not a good hiring strategy, okay? But realistically, you could use things like social media, and can, and they do, use these to pull words out of their feeds to determine what kind of personality they are. 
So and then it just comes with any other input. So early advancements have already started to, to happen. Teams is integral into this. You've started to see the transcripts for talks. There are suppliers out there that will run tools over your transcripts to start to look for words and phrases that become problematic. All right? They can run them over things like Facebook. The people who devised this framework actually run an analytics company, so that tells you something. All right? So why aren't we talking about it more? Well, it's the old rat in the maze. One, it creeps people out. You tend to talk to them about it, and they get uncomfortable really quick. How dare you use a machine to look at what I post online? The other problem is, is as soon as internal threat actors know that they're being monitored, they can change their behavior. Believe it or not, that's how I got into this. Three or four years ago, my day job is actually social engineer and threat intelligence. So I studied this to determine what behaviors as a social engineer I should not be triggering when I go and sit for long periods in a company. <clears throat> how basically not to raise the red flags. So we talk about Soffit, but we tend not to talk about it openly because companies don't really want to tell staff that they're being monitored at that level or that they might be digging into their personal lives. So it really is probably already here in terms of some of the tools. It's hard to get real figures on them because these companies are not making themselves overly marketing apparent as to what they're doing, all right? But it is starting to take things from other sectors and other feeds, all right? You've started to see, uh, you know, Microsoft Teams. You've also started to see things like AI cameras. You have to smile to get in. That's using things like fax from Ekman. Uh, you also get things like Navarro's uh, body language, and that comes next. Cameras that will automatically determine whether you're a threat actor based on your body language. Okay? So in essence, this camera will basically give you a, uh, a heads up as to somebody's likely to be a threat actor as they're walking through your courtyard. Now, they claim accuracy to a reasonable degree. I am not here to tell you that this tool is foolproof, and realistically, they're, they're claiming accuracy in the 70 percentile, which may or may not be high enough for human false positives, all right? So evolution and the practical application means that they've started to create Bayesian engines that will take all of those broken down factors, the fully expanded model, into account, yeah, and feed all those things in to start to give you numbers as to whether that, that person may or may not be a threat. So, talk about the ethics of this. A lot of people, when I give this talk, get really freaked out about it. They don't like the idea. They certainly don't like the idea of a machine trawling through everything they've ever written online uh, to determine whether they're a threat, and they certainly don't like the results sometimes when they get them. Uh, I neither agree nor disagree with its usage. There are aspects of this tool that I see very useful, especially for early intervention and preventing things like flight risk. Skills within companies are harder and harder to keep hold of. Pen testing tends to be one of them. You want to see changes in behavior that you can interact or engage with earlier to stop that person leaving with all those skills that they basically have and you don't want to lose for the, for the, for the sake of either a small change in their working habits or maybe a discussion about pay. It has obvious flaws and benefits. It's statistics. There's a lot of statistics in the background, and as we all know, there are lies, damn lies in statistics, and humans are chaotic by their very nature. So this is never going to be a perfect model. It has potential for abuse, and it has potential for false positives. However, the more data it gets, the more likely it is to actually be accurate, all right? The prevention of dangerous outliers is not yet proven. And I say proven because there have been use cases, but I have yet to see any evidence or that's in the public view that it's actually been used to intercept someone who was about to do something, say, uh, 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 you know, take somebody properly for an insider threat or run the ransomware or something like that. They've often been used to indicate who was a threat post-exploit, post as it gets more data, it's going to become far more accurate. Uh, it's not a pleasant topic, and a lot of people don't like talking about it, but it really should be on our radar. Okay, this is the bibliography. This is not the only papers. There are about 
well over 100 papers on the topic. Uh, they're, they're just everywhere. The problem is, is very few people actually go to read them. Um, and they can be very, very difficult to read because they're often heavily skewed onto statistics and psychological stuff, which a lot of techies don't necessarily like. So I have left myself just enough time for some questions. So that has been my very, very quick and very fast talk on SOFIT, or SOFIT, if you're American, uh, whichever you wish to prefer. But um, are there any questions from the floor? Yes. Go on. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Amazing talk. So how can we protect employees from abusive HR and management if reading these papers requires PhD level education and those who are using those methods unlikely would have such to understand what that even means? It is, that is fair, which is one of the reasons that the framework tries to break it down into obvious behaviors, yeah, and things that are easily seen or identified. Rather than deal with the huge topic, it tends to break it down into tiny, tiny little pieces that you can actually say, that I can observe, that I can actually see someone do. Okay? Try, it tries to take this, uh, the people who made the framework understand that they need to take the psychology out of it and give people an ability to, to basically just get a number out of it. But it will give them a series of buttons or flags or whatever or indicators or things that can be pulled in from the wider network such as access controls that can feed into that. They don't then need to make the decision. Any other questions? Go on. Good question. Ethically, I think you should tell your staff. However, most companies won't because it tends to make people upset and it changes their behavior by telling them. The rat's in the maze problem. As soon as the rat knows it's in a maze, it starts to, to not behave in the same way. So I would want to tell staff, and if I work for a company that did it, I would want to know, but I, I have a feeling that it will not go that way. Things like Teams, like I said, the tools that they're building into things like Teams, they're not, they're not marketing them as open. They're marketing to the, to the socks and the seams as you should quietly install this in the background. I do have one other question. Go for it. Um, given that some of the data you're entering, uh, you kind of go into a subjective question and then turn that into a statistical analysis. How do you avoid that subjective? It's the weighting. Remember I discussed about the weighting of certain behaviors? Obviously, certain behaviors may not be problematic unless they start to recur in multiple, multiple times. What Soffit tends to do is give you the ability to track those and then add them up. So, okay, you've started to notice this person is absent every third Monday. Yeah, okay, and they've done it for an entire year. What's going on there? Yeah, uh, are they doing something wrong? I mean, is it sickness? But if it is sickness, it's really, uh, it's a pattern. And that pattern may need mean something else uh, or something we may want to intervene in. It may be, you know, they come back and tell you, I have childcare issues. Every third Monday, my childcare person won't work for me. That could be something you could intervene with and say, well, look, we can sort that out. We can change your working patterns, uh, flexible working, and then you don't have to take in a sick day and lie to us. You can do it openly, and we'll work with you to make your life easier. Yes? Yeah, I knew, I, I didn't mention that because my name is not Tom Cruise and I hate that comparison and there is nobody sitting in a pool under this framework. <laughs> All right. So thinking of like maybe if we have a, sorry, if we have a um, kind of insider threat incident, um, I'm there in that incident response trying to look for kind of evidence for what's occurred, who, who did cause this to happen. Um, and maybe your framework's pointing to Joe Bloggs and we kind of focus in on him maybe we could miss someone else that we maybe not an analyze properly or could it stream us down too far into? The, the, I, I did say, I in. mean, I have to agree. Yeah, it, it has the potential for, for abuse or false positives, especially if your data set is not full. 
okay? Which is one of the reasons this is tying into so many other things like cameras and various other aspects to give you the non-observed view, for want of a better description, and it starts to pull into things like uh, Facebook posts, it's starting to, it can, I mean, one of the tools that I've seen claims it can read DMs, which means it's looking at non-observable or non-public behavior, which is supposed to be more true to them. But it is fair to say that if you don't have a clear picture, you may make incorrect or biased decisions, which may not be valid. By all means. Thank you for that. Quite welcome. Truly brilliant. Uh, just from a, an intelligence perspective, and certainly if, for any of you that work on regulated engagements where you need to produce scenarios, hopefully you, a lot of you are running scenario generation for insiders uh, anyway. But you know, very much, you know, when I do maturity assessments for those types of areas, everyone is tracking APTX, APTY, TA, whatever it is. But what's the infrastructure? What are the indicators that you're looking for outside of that? Have you built those into your intelligence collection plans? How are you collecting them? How are you integrating them? Are good questions. The HR bit, when we do those maturity questions, on the Crest website, you will find the CTI maturity assessments. And in there, you will see very clear questions that say, do you have a relationship with HR? Do you have a relationship with marketing? Do you have a relationship with PR? Because all of these people see employee sentiment. And are you collecting those sorts of things in there as well? And then just one final thing, because it is Crest. We talked ethics. We didn't quite talk about legal. Please do also consider that if you were working for certain government organizations or any government organization, or even as a third party supporting them, there are things like Ripper that you also need to, to consider. So make sure specifically around insider threats, you've always got legal counsel consult on all of those collection elements. Tom, thank you so much. You're welcome. Big round of applause. <laughs>